Hi, I'm Emily Linden. I'm the founder of The Unslut Project, and I'm so excited to welcome you to our live discussion panel event. We are going to be talking about slut shaming, what it is and how to stop it. We're doing this as a fundraiser for our Kickstarter for Slut, a documentary film, which some of you have heard about. If you want to know more about it, follow the link at the bottom of the page. All five of the experts speaking today are going to be featured in the documentary film. They'll each be speaking for about five minutes and then we'll open it up for a discussion. So we really encourage you to participate either by raising your hand and typing in your question, or you can use audio or video chat to ask us whatever you want to know about what we're talking about today. So we're going to start with Dr. Amy Marsh, a clinical sexologist and sexuality educator. She teaches here at our host school, Creative Sexuality Education. And before we start, I should say a big thank you to Ava and Creative Sexuality Education for hosting us. So Dr. Amy Marsh. Well, thank you, Emily. I'm really happy to be here. And thank you too to Ava of Creative Sexuality. I'm excited to be on this program and to be talking about this topic, slut shaming. My name is uh, Amy Marsh. I am a board certified clinical sexologist and ASECT certified sex counselor and also a sexuality educator. I teach as a associate professor at the Institute for Advanced Study of Human Sexuality. And I also have a lot of different online classes here on creative sexuality. So again, I'm really happy to be here and thank you. And in the few moments that I have, I want to just get into a larger, broader context. I want to put slut shaming in the broader context of human rights and women's rights in particular. And so if you're looking at the slide, you're seeing that there have been some documents that deal with uh, gender equality and the empowerment of women. This is the United Nations Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women done way back in 1979. And one of the goals was to ensure elimination of all acts of discrimination against women by persons, organizations, or enterprises. Well, as you know, we still have a ways to go on all of this. But slut shaming is definitely an act of profound discrimination. Uh, yes, it involves elements of misogyny, sexism, social injustice, bullying, even sexual violence, and so on. But it's also discrimination because we do not have our full agency or enjoyment of our own sexuality, our embodiment, even our sensuality, when we're in danger of being slut shamed or we're experiencing this. So let's acknowledge that right away, that when somebody does this kind of thing, it's being done to people who deserve to have full enjoyment of their sex lives, as well as full enjoyment of their innocence, because some very young people are being slut shamed as well, and they're being accused of doing things they don't even fully understand. They're not informed about what these things are in some cases. They know it just sounds bad, because they're being told they're bad for allegedly doing these things, whatever they are. So this is happening in some cases at a very young age to people, and it's uh, really quite tragic. Now in the next slide, I'm talking about intersections and complexities of slut shaming. And, and again, it's within the realm of sexism, it's a form of sexism and misogyny even plays into rape culture, definitely. There is a lot of bullying and violence, even as I mentioned before, against very young people. Uh, the study of suicide, the consequences of suicide are definitely part of this bigger picture. And I'll talk more about that in a moment. And slut shaming can definitely take on uh, elements of racism and class discrimination and uh, religion and cultural, cultural aspects play into this as well. For example, uh, somebody who is white and wealthy and popular in a high school setting uh, may not be slut shamed, even though they're doing just as much or as more as a person who's being accused. And a person being accused may be seen as uh, being lower class. They may be a different ethnicity. Um, you know, subject to racism. Uh, there may be cultural and religious conflicts going on here. 
And uh, so whoever is the underdog, I guess I'm trying to say, in a social setting may be more likely to be slut-shamed than somebody who is somehow positioned with a status that is higher. And I think we really need to look at that, too. And I mentioned women's rights and human rights and sexual human rights, which I'm hoping that Dr. Ted McElvena from the Institute for Advanced Study of Human Sexuality will be getting into in a moment. Uh, we could also, if we're sociologists, get into theories of social deviance, again, looking at who is considered deviant or lower status in a group, and are they more likely to be slut-shamed, and who's doing the shaming? That's another thing I think we need to look at. And there's also just the aspect of, for many young people, just getting out of high school alive and somehow intact, and uh, that can be a big deal. So going to the next slide, uh, I thought about the person who's being the target of a, a slut-shaming response. So first of all, there's somebody who initiates the process. And uh, so I'm ta calling this an assault, the first shaming assault. And then we have peers chiming in with maybe whispering, pushing the person Let's imagine it's you being slut-shamed, pushing you up against a locker. There's social media messages swirling around you, cell phone texting. All this stuff is being passed around you and about you, and it's like a web, you know, that's the closing in and, and shrinking. And you don't know how to get free of these things, especially if you're a lot younger, and you don't know if there are any resources out there that might help you. So... Then we've got family response as well, which may or may not be of any use to you or any help. Families may or may not be sympathetic. Maybe they think that you've actually done something wrong and, uh, and they're not helpful. Maybe they're also going to shame you and punish you as well. Um, or that old saying, where there's smoke, there's fire. Uh, so they may think, well, because there's talk, it must mean that there's some truth in it. And then, of course, there's the problem that institutional responses may or may not be helpful. You know, there may be a school counselor who is helpful, but then the president, I'm sorry, not the president, but the principal of the school might not, you know. And then if this incident becomes a tragedy of some kind, as sometimes they are, then you've got the whole other wider community involvement, the response with media and everybody wringing their hands and saying, oh, such a shame. And, you know, it's one more ugly, horrible incident that ruins the lives of many people, family members, you know, because if there's a tragic outcome, you know, then this means that family and friends have lost somebody dear to them because of the slut shaming. And, you know, media, of course, chimes in with these things as well. Now, we've got to talk about sexual stigmatization and suicide. And we already know that sexual minorities, students who are uh, lesbian, gay, bisexual, queer, uh, questioning, they are much more likely to attempt suicide than peers. And now this is an old study that I'm citing here from 1999. In, who knows, statistics might be worse. Uh, gender variant, transgender, and transsexual people um, Forty-one percent of them have attempted suicide, and I think for the population as a whole in the United States, it's more like three percent. So you can see how um, vindictive and how devastating this kind of stigmatization can be. You know, because there's a lot of bullying, there's a lot of social social media stuff that can go on around somebody who is in a sexual or a gender minority, and the Women and girls, and I'm focusing again on female, those who are sexually active or perceived to be sexually active are also very much targeted. And, uh, and I'm including in this category not just cisgender women and girls, but also trans women and girls. And suicide, aside from being violently and sexually assaulted, suicide is the worst outcome here. And there are very, very high risks of suiciding in situations like this. And so I want to look at that. We are steeped in this country in a situation where suicide is the third leading cause of death for youth between the ages of 10 and 24. 
And because this is the climate and the fame of the tragedies that have happened when, you know, suicide has been the result of a slut shaming or bullying, it's more likely that a person being shamed in this way might perceive this as the only way out. And, you know, this is truly terrible. So you're looking at the statistics here in the Center for Disease Control. 157,000 youth treated in the emergency room for self-inflicted harm. So we're not talking just about deaths. We're also talking about the harm that comes from suicide attempts. And we also want to look here at the fact that Native American and Alaskan Native youth have the highest suicide rates and Hispanic youth are more at risk than black and white non-Hispanic peers. Um, looking at the risk factors and looking at this stressful life event or loss, uh, being slut-shamed, being bullied in this way, having your entire community of peers ganging up on you is definitely a stressful life event. And it's also one of the kinds of things that exposes you to the suicidal behavior of others because there are these famous incidents of some young person who has been bullied in this way and who has decided to end her life or, or his life too in some cases. So we really need to think about the larger issue of suicide and the way that this is really part of our culture and young people are very aware of suicide and when suicides happen. And so I'm thinking that what any young person who's being bullied or, or any older person for that matter, but I'm, I'm focusing somewhat here on the younger people, uh, they need resources, they need tools, and they need strategies to deal with the situation. But that's very difficult to access or think through, especially when they're younger. Um, they need personal strategies. They need to be able to deal with the initial person who's assaulted them with the shame. They need strategies and ways to deal with peers, with their social networks and what's happening, and with their family and the immediate community. There needs to be institutional responses that deal with the shamer, with the peers, with the networks, and with the community that also includes therapists, helping professionals, and agencies. And again, with the initial shamer, there may need to be some legal strategies, definitely looking at what's happening with peers and social networks. And there should be a public awareness campaign of consequences. What happens if you engage in shaming and bullying another person. And uh, we just need much more of this, very clear responses and very clear ways for the person who's being bullied to get that help and for people who are tempted to bully to realize that actually this is not something they should do. And finally, in my last slide, I'm advocating radical, worldwide, profound cultural and systems change on every level. We should no longer be bullying anybody for their sexual expression. And we need also some specialized training, I believe, for suicide and hotline counselors. I've worked myself on a uh, crisis line, and I know that we actually didn't get any specialized training at that point for uh, this issue of slut shaming. Um, that may be changing now in some places, but I'm not sure that it has. If it hasn't, uh, definitely the counselors need to know more about that. Uh, the same goes for mental health counselors, therapists, school counselors, sexologists, medical personnel, and so on. Um, we really need to understand the devastating impact of this issue when it happens to somebody. Um, slut shaming and its uh, consequences and what it does should be part of our comprehensive sex and gender education for people of all ages. And we also need to make sure that we factor in gender equality, which includes acknowledgement of gender as non-binary, and which is inclusive of trans and gender variant people, and particularly acknowledges the experience of trans women. And I'm, again, putting this in the context of slut shaming and what it can do. And actually, uh, I lied, that wasn't my last slide, but I want to make everyone everywhere understand that they can be a no shame zone and that we can extend the zone to other people so that we don't shame others, either consciously or inadvertently for their behavior. And with that, I'm going to say thank you very much. And uh, again, 
very excited to be part of this project and uh, hoping that the documentary uh, is completed and uh, really does the work that it's going to be able to do. All right, thank you. Thank you, that was great. Thank Amy. you, Amy. Thanks. So I would like to welcome Leor Leora Tannenbaum, who's our next presenter. Leora is the author of Slut, Growing Up Female with a Bad Reputation. And um, she, that was published in 2000, and she's currently working on an update of that, which should be released in the next couple of years. Uh, thanks, Leora. Oh, hey, thank you so much, Emily, for inviting me to participate in the Unslut project and in tonight's event. And thank you, Ava, for um, putting all this together. I'm really happy to be here. So I wrote a book that um, first came out in 1999 called Sluts, Growing Up Female with a Bad Reputation. And in that book, I coined the term slut bashing to describe the experience of girls in middle school and high school who are labeled sluts by their peers. And I interviewed over 50 girls and women around the country, different racial, ethnic, socioeconomic backgrounds, different geographic backgrounds. And the main thing that I found, which is not going to be a surprise to anybody listening, is that the majority of the girls who had been labeled plus were either not sexually active at all or were not any more sexually active than their peers were. Um, I did all that research before sexting and texting and Facebook and Instagram and everything. It's a different world now, so I just uh, finished the second round of research where I just interviewed 55 girls and women, primarily between the ages of 14 and 22, focusing on high school and college age. Again, different racial, ethnic, socioeconomic, and geographic backgrounds. And I um, am working on a book, finishing it up right now. Hopefully, it'll come out in um, a little over a year from HarperCollins. And um, why did I go back and revisit this? Because so much has changed. The whole discourse around sluttiness and slut shaming has changed. When I talked about slut bashing in 1999, that was a very specific phenomenon affecting one, maybe two girls in every school. What's different now is slut shaming. We still have slut bashing, which is a form of sexual harassment. It is verbal sexual harassment, and it sometimes can get physical as well. Slut shaming is more diffuse. And at this point, I would say pretty confidently that every single girl will be called a slut at some point um, before she graduates college, if she goes to college, before the age of 22. She may be calling herself a slut or a hoe also. That's the other big difference. So the two main differences I find in the 21st century are, A, how incredibly common this has become. It's not a rarity anymore. And, two, the fact that so many females call themselves sluts often in um, a lighthearted way and in a positive way, we have this new contradiction that um, although it may have existed 15, 20 years ago, it was very small scale compared to the way it is now, where girls want to be thought of as slutty. They, want, they have um, a positive image of what sluttiness is, and they embrace it. And to them, it's sort of feminism light. I'm owning my sexuality. This is who I am. I'm proud of my sex. They may not even be sexually active. Um, but they're proud of their bodies. They want to show off, you know, that they're confident about themselves as sexual beings, even girls as young as 11, 12, 13, 14. Um, but then inevitably, and I say inevitably for a reason, whether it happens today, tomorrow, a month, or a year from now, they discover they can't control being thought of as a good slut. It always uh, falls back against them. It always ricochets against them and backfires, and they become known as a bad slut. And nobody wants to be known as a bad slut. That's the worst thing that can happen. Dr. Marsh just walked us through the whole thing very nicely, so we all know, you know, worst-case scenario, of course, um, suicide, but there are certainly other um, terrible negative consequences that stem from being labeled a slut, a bad slut. So the idea that a girl can control her identity as a so-called good slut is um, optimistic and naive. And unfortunately, um, girls are not aware of the fact that this is something they can't control. And 
we as adults in their lives, we have a responsibility to help them understand that uh, I'm, not, uh, I'm not saying they shouldn't feel proud of their sexuality and they shouldn't feel good about their bodies. Of course, we all want those things. But they need to learn and we need to show them how to do that in a way that it won't backfire against them. So for those reasons, I am very proud and excited to be part of the Unsplot Project and um, happy to participate in this long-term and huge and important educational project that we're all involved in. So thank you. Thank you. I want to apologize to everybody listening. I'm afraid that I am going to have to excuse myself now. I'm so sorry that I can't hear everybody and participate in the conversation. Um, so please forgive me. Um, but thank you so much for listening. And again, I'm just happy that we're all working on this very important project. We are too. Thank you for joining us as long as you could. Thank you. Have a great evening, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. For those of you who are just joining us, um, we are talking to five of the experts who will be featured on SLUT, a documentary film. Uh, we're raising funds for our Kickstarter, which is um, linked at the bottom of your page. And you can find it through our website, too, www.unsletproject.com, for more information. So we just hope you'll consider giving whatever you can. The next expert who we're going to speak with is Natalie Mills. Um, she's a licensed marriage and family therapist, and she specializes in sex, intimacy, and sex workers' issues. So welcome, Natalie. Thanks, Emily. First of all, thanks for having me, and thanks, Ava, for help coordinating this and putting this on. I'm really glad to be here. Um, I work primarily with couples for sex and intimacy issues, and I work with a lot of sex workers. And a way that I've seen that slut shaming is dangerous in, permission, in um, particular for sex workers is the stigma just of sex work alone. And um, it, I think that's the other end of the spectrum that I see is that so terrible to be sexual, and it's so terrible um, to be thought of as a slut or a whore. That if you're an actual whore and you're doing that work, then that's the worst kind of work that you can be doing, and it's not thought of as work. And if something violent happens to you on the job, then there's no recourse for you because it's not a legal job. And I think that's one of the worst. Um, I think that's one of the worst. Symptoms of slut um, So I think that's one way um, that I see women impacted and men um, impacted incredibly. Um, I think to be to kind of dovetail off of um, what Leora was saying earlier, um, a lot of the women that I see are incredibly proud of the work that they do, the sex work that they do, who they are, their sexuality. They identify as what they identify as whores. And they don't see that there's, a lot of the women don't see that there's kind of a negative way that you can be seen sexually in that way. It's just the way that people view sexuality. And it's almost as though slut shaming turns out to be sex shaming. And um, over time, I, it seems like I've seen that female sexuality equals transgressive acts. So if you're a female and you have, you're proud of your sexuality, you're automatically um, a transgressor or something terrible. Um, and so I think that's where we need to put a lot of our effort into um, for community and schools and media and culture um, is to get people to start asking questions about what do we mean when we say what and what do we mean when we're talking in the way that we're talking and responding to women in the way that we're responding to them about their sexuality and about their sex. And why do we mean that? Why why do we feel so aggressively about that? And why do we feel so violent about that? Um, I think it's important to get people to start thinking about their perspectives about both men and women's sexuality and question why we have the perspectives that we have and where they came from. I, I think um, I hear still in the 21st century all too often that boys will be boys, um, and girls kind of have to button it up. Um, I also see this in people who are non-sex workers, 
I see this in a lot of couples who are afraid to be sexual with each other or they're afraid to kind of, quote, go too far or um, some of them don't even want to talk about what their sexuality is or they don't want to talk about what their desires are, some of their fantasies. They're afraid to talk about that with each other. People who've been together for a long time, um, they're afraid. I hear a lot of um, people say they're afraid to be seen as what? Um, as though it would be a bad thing and we're not allowing ourselves to express our sexuality freely with each other and with ourselves and um, we're incredibly kept and we're imprisoning ourselves and it doesn't for what if there's a there's a huge fear and it's um, it's not healthy so I think that we have to start asking questions about why and I think one of the main things that I see every day is that something that bothers me is why does female sexuality equals transgression um, I don't understand so um, that's something that I want to understand better and um, so that I think as soon as we can understand that better and start working on that, we can decrease some violence. Mm -hmm. It's happening a lot. So that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Natalie. You brought up a lot of awesome points that I hope we'll be able to get to. Um, Thank you. I, I've been taking notes, and I'm excited to talk about them with you. Um, <laughs> for those of you who just joined us, we are uh, fundraising for our Kickstarter for Slut, a documentary film. And all of our experts who are here um, to talk with you and share their opinions about slut shaming and how we can stop it will be featured in our film. So it's a chance. Um, we're going to have the Reverend Dr. Ted McElvena um, share his opinions. He's the founder of the Institute for the Advanced Study of Human Sexuality in San Francisco, and he's also a retired Methodist minister um, and pretty legendary in the sexology world. So hi, Dr. Ted. Hi. How are you guys doing? Great. You sound wonderful, all of you. A number of years ago, uh, I'll tell you some stories. I'm 81 years old. I've been around a long time been in the sex field almost forever. I'm uh, Las Vegas, surrounded by a whole lot of uh, wonderful women where we're putting together a new show of sex behind the Iron Curtain, and the focus is on women's sexuality behind the Iron Curtain. I love it. Uh, one of the things that we did a number of years ago, we want to know about teenage girls in a conservative area. So we took the San Joaquin Valley and asked them, these were girls after they graduated from high school, uh, what they wanted most about sex. And we thought, well, the guys call them up or anything that happened or, or certain things that they needed to know. And uh, they came out with the majority of the, of the teenage girls said they wanted to be a good lay. Now, that's an interesting statement because it wasn't what we expected. And uh, one of the things that we have noticed is a shift, that now there's a great uh, focus on female empowerment all across the world. Now, remember, we have 141 million women who have been mutilated that, so their sexuality couldn't come forward. But I just opened a new center in China where I'm doing a training program well, we're training women to service 9,000 centers for the empowerment of female sexuality. What I'm talking about not is for them uh, to be involved and be used. We're telling them that, first of all, they must make a commitment to their own sexuality through self-pleasuring, through learning the skills of valuing their sexuality. So it's seen as to belong to themselves and not to somebody else. Now, uh, I, as a, somebody who comes out of a religious theological background, who was trained uh, for many years about what was right and wrong and what I had been told, and over the years I, I have come to the position I've just been lied to by everybody because they wanted to control uh, my sexuality and the sexuality of others. And the first thing we have to do is to tell young women to value their sexuality, to be proud of what they know, and to give them information and skill training. Uh, I'm reminded of the religious traditions that control people's sexuality. And I still believe that 50% of the problems uh, of this flooding business of calling people things are religiously and culturally based. Uh, I think of that wonderful story 
about the woman who is caught in adultery and is surrounded by all these men who have stones and are just going to smash her head. Just then Jesus arrives with his white horse and gets out and said, He is without sin, cast the first stone. Just then a sweet little uh, white-haired woman came forward, picked up a boulder and smashed the woman's head. And Jesus said to her, Mother, sometimes you really piss me off. Now, that's an awful story, but it's very true. We still think that somehow there's a, a, a kind of purity that's better than somebody being embracing and valuing their sexuality. Uh, purity is its own reward, but sexuality is a much greater reward, and we don't tell girls this. And girls have to insist upon it. The worst of all, the mothers have to insist upon it. And I, I blame our institutions, uh, and as I'm dealing with it still, everybody wants to control female sexuality. I think the whole issue is uh, if we're going to deal with this, uh, we have to help the young women who are being told that they have no value because they're maybe too interested in sex. Uh, I think we ought to celebrate those women. I think we ought to give them awards. I think we ought to and say, they're the most valuable um, things in high school. I can remember when I was a young man, I, I, I went, went all over the place hoping that I would find one of these women. <laughs> I never did, but uh, I sure looked for them. And again, we play this double standard. And I think what we have to do is say, tell these girls that how valuable they are, and we hope that out of their experiences they've had to celebrate it rather than feel bad and feel shameful about it. But we have to stop feeling shameful about it. And that's so very hard to do institutionally because we want people to have control and management rather than say, be good at what you do. Uh, now you've had some experiences. Now build on those experiences. Some of them are successful, but make them better rather than deal with the factor. Don't be ashamed. Celebrate it. And uh, uh, I, I don't like our sexuality to be controlled by people who are therapists anymore. I'm against the sin and sickness people controlling sexuality. I would rather us have programs that say, hey, sex is a wonderful thing. And that's why I've changed my position from <clears throat> trying to control people to set them free. And I think that's that's, I hope the goal that we have uh, is to tell these women that as young women, they're valuable, they're valuable, their sexuality is a wonderful thing, and uh, we want to help you celebrate it rather than uh, help you suppress it. I hate the gray ladies who go in to, uh, and to tell people who are dying of cancer, well, it's just manage, just manage and suffer for it. You don't have to suffer for it, and those young women don't have to. I'm not a believer that they have to pay anything because they got really interested in the sex. And I used to say, aren't they lucky? And that's kind of a, maybe a radical approach, but I think it's the only approach that I see that works, especially with a number of Chinese women who I want them to feel guilty with me because instead of dealing with sex, which I'm there to train them, they want to shop all the time. Now, I, <laughs> now how do you stop Chinese women from shopping? You cannot stop young women or being sexual. And I think that one of the things is we want to help them be good at what they're doing. And uh, so that everybody looks at them, they could be the sex educators in the high school and not the boys. You know the boys are running around with raging hormones. The girls are, are trying to figure out a way not only to manage their own sexuality, but to manage that of boys. Let's help them learn the social skills that are involved. Okay, that's all I got to say. Thank you, Dr. Ted. I, that's wonderful. Really appreciate it. Um, next, uh, we have Dr. Carol Queen. She owns Good Vibrations in San Francisco. She also runs the Center for Sex and Culture. She's an author, speaker, and wonderful sex educator. So thanks for joining us, Dr. Carol Queen. I'm so pleased to be with you. And I, I want to clarify that I'm a staff sexologist at Good Vibrations and also um, that I wrote Exhibitionism for the Shy, which is not unrelated to this topic either. 
And the things that I'm thinking about as I'm listening to the other wonderful panelists and that I contemplate this project and this, and this larger overarching issue. In the first place, I want to call out that this is a week when we've just heard um, the, the entire media of the United States go insane over Miley Cyrus and her performance. This clearly uh, slut shaming in the air on many sides about about the performance that she did. There's more to it than just her sexuality, I think, as far as what commentators are talking about. But 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 people really are talking about her sexuality right front and center. And that just this week, uh, a judge in Montana gave a man uh, 30 days in jail for having raped a 14 year old, saying that she was older than her years and a participant in the activity. So you can't, you, can't, you can't let a week go by in this country without the issues that we're talking about on the panel and that the Unslot Project is, is doing action around um, being passed around in, in headlines and talked about around water coolers. And, and so what this makes me think is that it, it's really so deeply sunk into the challenges that we have as a culture as we change around sexuality-related issues, as we have more access to information, as more people have access, especially to the Internet, to speak up in a positive way, as there are um, cultural changes going on around LGBTQ people, that there, there's a lot going on, and much of it can be considered positive. Part of it I think, is, is culture shock and culture war associated. Uh, clearly, there's misogyny laced through and through the slut shaming. But you, you look just a couple of, of degrees away and you see how close the slut shaming is to people who are being shamed for just their sexual orientation. So it's not just young women being sexual. It's not just women. It's not probably even just being sexual. It's the way that this culture has a hard time looking at difference, especially in semi-closed settings like schools, in smaller communities. And it's the way that, as Ted said, there's a degree of fascination about women and women's sexuality. It's commodified in many ways. We see it in fashion. We see it in kids' toys. Clearly, we see it in porn. We see it all over the place. And not everybody has negative feelings or feelings of wanting to cause shame around it. But there's also a genie that I think a lot of or a bottle, a lot of people in our culture want to put the genie back into, and it just can't happen. It's 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 not going to happen. And at this point, I think young women understand sexuality as something that they have just as much a right to be curious about as young men always have been given space to be. Whether or not people are sexually active, sexual curiosity and, and being understood by people around you as a sexual person is enough to open the Pandora's box lid of shaming. And that means that the people who are doing the shaming are also ashamed. And it's happening so much in high school contexts that I have to, to finish my remarks by saying that I think it's partly a phenomenon having to do with how bad sex education is in high schools, most of, in most parts of the country still. There's a, a degree of turning to sex education as the place where people will learn about sexuality so that they can, for their adolescence, they can become an adult, they can fledge, they can, they can become sexual adults eventually. But that's not what sex education does in our schools. And, and so everyone who has gone to sex ed classes ends up not being well served by the boundary support issues that, that might be a good idea to have learned in a class where um, people are sexually harassed and sexually pressured. Uh, talking about the question of shame and sexuality. So many people don't get that. Sex education so often tends to be, don't do it, it's scary, it's dangerous, this is why. And that doesn't give anybody any skills and any abilities to say, I'm curious about doing it, uh-oh, I already did it, 
I did it and I liked it or I did it and I didn't even have full choice and, and agency around whether to do it. Uh, I, I did it in either of those contexts and other people are giving me a hard time about it. And this should be front and center in sex education. It should absolutely be things that all parents talk to their young people about and there should be as much outcry about the fact of slut shaming as it happens when when people don't commit suicide, when the worst doesn't happen, as when the worst does happen. And that's what I hope that the Unslut Project is going to help us do as a culture, is make sure that this discourse is clear to everyone as a crucial discourse to have. This This isn't going to get better by itself. If anything, it's getting worse. And the fact that we, who are adults who are sex positive or in the sexuality education or therapy world in any way, recognize the after effect as being lifelong only reiterates to me that we have to do something. It's not just kids who are suffering behind this. It's everybody who grows up in a context where slut shaming was part of their their youth and their upbringing. So I'm so excited that the Unslut Project is, is doing this fundraising campaign. I really urge everyone to give as generously as they can. And, and not only that, for all of us to talk about these issues everywhere we can, with our partners, with our families, with our friends, when appropriate in workplace contexts, certainly in the schools because that's the only kind of thing that's going to move us away from this terrible place where sexuality is ubiquitous and nobody can honor one another for their relationship to it. That's ridiculous and it has to stop. Thank you, Dr. Queen. Um, I think that's great. You, you mentioned sex education, and actually we had a question come in um, from one of our audience members. Katie asked if there's a program, and I can open this up, um, to all of our experts, maybe maybe one of you will know, if there's a curriculum now that is um, representative of comprehensive sex ed or the sex ed that Dr. Queen was talking about that you'd be able to recommend to educators. I can actually recommend a curriculum which is, is Our Whole Lives, which um, the Unitarian Universalist and United Church of Christ are, are the, the entities that, that make that available. And there are those uh, denominations of church in many parts of, of the country, so many people have access to this. Although you have to opt into it. It's not, it's not a school-based curriculum. Um, it's a, a little braver than that. School-based curricula tend not to be very brave. Right. Great. Well, thank you. Um, thank I, you I, I disagree. I, I disagree. I can't recommend that. Uh, remember the largest amount of suicide uh, you have is among, uh, proportionately among an affinity group or Mormon boys who don't stop masturbating, a uh, higher suicide rate among them than any women or any other group. We don't even say anything about that. you got to recognize that a lot of suicides uh, have to do with a person's commitment to their own body, to their own sexuality, which may indeed uh, be a matter of masturbation. And that this, that's the area that we have to focus on, making people commitment, commit to their own bodies, to their own fantasies, and the stories they tell themselves. It's not just a matter of the shame that might happen in a group of people. People kill themselves. Other people aren't killing them. And uh, we have to be pretty accurate if, if we're going to deal with this issue. Shaming must be stopped, absolutely. But let's look really at the cause. A lot of the causes or attitudes about sexuality that are, are sex negative and destructive. And remember, let's look at the actual amount of sex outlet people have, what they're doing and how they feel about those things, not just what somebody else is saying about them. Well, Dr. Ted, you brought up um, a good point that leads me into the way that I had structured this discussion, which was to start with talking about what we mean when we talk about slut shaming in the first place. So. Um, all of you have offered a, a, very, a variation of solutions and addressing different aspects of slut shaming and um, bullying generally. Um, and so I think a good place to start would be to talk about what slut shaming is. Um, I've come up with a few questions that can lead us there. How do we define it? How is it manifested, supported, and reaffirmed? Uh, Dr. Queen talked about that a little, um, as did Natalie. How has it changed over time? 
and how does it differ by demographic? So we don't need to address all of these, but I just thought this could um, spark kind of what Dr. Ted suggested, or if any of our audience members want to jump in with more specific questions to talk about what we were talking about when we talk about slut shaming in the first place. So Art Noble says, it appears that in the general public, we each have our own definition of sex and sexuality. What work is being done on defining these two words? Does anyone want to jump in there? Definition of sex and sexuality. Well, sex is being defined as what people do and how they feel about what they do, which are appropriate topics of, of uh, what we deal with as sexologists. And uh, I think what we have to recognize is that, that, that the majority of our sex outlet is going to be self-pleasuring. Certainly, uh, we talk about it on the basis of, of statistics. Uh, uh, I'm going to have, and I'm 81 years old, probably about 30,000 sex outlets in my life. Even though I've been married for 58 years, the majority of those, if you count them, are going to have is masturbation. One of the things that we have found is that uh, young women who make a commitment to their own body and to their own pleasure through masturbation are far much less likely to commit suicide for any reason. The same reason we find that the mothers uh, who take their daughters to be mutilated because of more marriageable material, if we get them masturbating in African countries, they're much less likely to take their daughters to be mutilated. And if you get a person to make a commitment to their own feelings and understand that sexual pleasure yourself is not necessarily dependent on some guy who's going to fuck you and then say, well, I'm going to shame you or something else. It has much more to do with how you feel about yourself, not uh, what somebody else is saying about you. And I, I'm saying until you have that kind of focus, it just plain doesn't work. You can say, all right, there's all that shaming stuff. But that doesn't kill people. That, you're not killing other people. It's not murder. Suicide is something you do to kill yourself. And that's how you feel about yourself. And the slut stopping is what women telling other women, it's all right to be sexual. It's, it's not all right for people to put you down because you're taking responsibility for your own sexual health. And that's what the issue is all about. Women have to tell other women. Ten times more important than men saying anything is for women to step forward. I was speaking to a group of women in South Africa a couple of years ago, and 5,000 black women in this huge convention had to get up and leave because I was a man talking with them about helping them learn to talk to other women about sex. I think that the slut approach, uh, understanding and slut approach, it's got to be done by women. I'm glad we, most of the panelists would be the women have to step forward and say, golly, if you know all that good stuff about sexuality, please share it with me. And uh, they don't. Women do not share that with other women. I'm amazed at, at trying to train Chinese women who don't know anything about intimacy because they don't know anything about intimacy with men, women, or anybody else. And I'm amazed at how difficult it, it, difficult it is for them to get to talk to other women about their commitment to their own sexuality. And I think that's where the answer is. But of course, That's a good uh, point, Dr. Chad. And actually, you know, masturbation is a kind of sex, obviously self-pleasuring sex. And um, we have a follow-up question from the one you were answering by Art Noble. He wants to know what a clinical definition of sex is. I think that was more along the lines of his question. So um, when we're talking about sexually active, um, a lot of people think that just means penis in vagina, intercourse, straight sex. People say, you know, sometimes gay People who haven't had sex with a member of the opposite sex are still virgins, technically. So I think um, Art's point might be that we need to uh, kind of embrace the idea that sex is inclusive of a lot more than how we generally throw around the term. So like you said, masturbation, um, oral sex is sex, um, digital sex, that type of thing. I don't know if anyone wants to comment on that. Well, I do. I, I think that there's that we lose so much by making a really narrow definition of what sex is or what sexual behavior is, partly because uh, the, the, the narrow definition mainly involves 
heterosexual penis vagina intercourse, and that's possibly not where the majority of many people's sexual pleasure comes from. So that's one thing to, to call out and, and, and mention. It's not just women's sexual pleasure either. There are many men who find that they have sexual opportunities and possibilities that are much more body focused and, and that they can lie back and relax into uh, when they're not trying to be the person on top, so to speak. So, so there's that. But I also think that it means that people don't take a lot of erotic possibilities seriously as sex. Um, either they don't take responsibility for the fact that it means that they're sexual if they do them, this notion that you can do practically anything except TV intercourse and still be a virgin is really problematic because once you become sexually intimate and connected either with another person or with yourself for that matter, you're being sexual. It's ridiculous to suggest that you're not. And so this notion that you can do a whole lot of stuff sexually and not really have had sex, I mean, that doesn't really protect anyone from being slut-shamed, now does it? It's pretty obvious that young women have been slut shamed for having oral sex. That is all kinds of different all kinds of different possibilities. And it it truncates our idea of what sexuality is and, and how our bodies actually function erotically and how we function emotionally too, really. And when we think about masturbation, uh, this this jumped into my mind when Ted started talking about this. Uh, during National Masturbation Month, which the Vibes has been doing for over 15 years now, one of the things that really comes up is how many people are ashamed of masturbation, don't want to say they masturbate, and have sex with other people, including sometimes quasi-consensual sex with other people, in order not to masturbate, thinking that partner sex is privileged over it. And you could ask yourself if the people who are doing the sexual things that will wind up uh, as, as slut-shaming scenarios were happily masturbating, would as many of those scenarios arise? I'm, I'm going to suggest that perhaps they wouldn't, and that this, this inculcated shame just about that, as Ted's talking about, is really part of the problem. It's a pretty awful yeah. thing when, I, when I, uh, in Africa, when I see a young woman uh, with her arm cut off because her husband uh, caught her masturbating. You know? And oh, but what we see is uh, always that the issue of somebody feeling that they want to control everybody else's sexuality. Uh, I wish we could change that whole thing. And uh, and as Dr. Kinsey once said when they asked, Dr. Kinsey, what do you think about masturbation? It's the most civilizing force in the world. And, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and and if we could, and we when we started working with a group of young black women about uh, on a pregnancy thing, we knew that if we could get those young black women uh, who to masturbate to value their sexuality, they were much less likely to have unwanted pregnancies. We published that data, and they had a fit. So anyway. Well, Dr. Ted, you brought us right into um, the second half of our discussion here, which is um, how do we stop it? So you said, I wish there were some way <laughs> to change this control that people um, want to have over each other's sexuality. So I hope that we could all, um, one of the things that kept coming up as you guys were speaking were how to um, show girls how to embrace their own sexuality, as you said, without it backfiring, um, something that um, Dr. Amy Marsh mentioned, um, in a positive way. And Natalie also mentioned female sex, female sex being equated with some kind of transgression, which I think ties in here as well. So how to kind of change the way that we're thinking about this. Um, some discussion points that we could touch upon, uh, what have we already done? So all of you are pioneers in this field. And um, we really appreciate you with this project. Also, what can we do on an individual level? What obstacles do we face, and what do we predict for the future? So where do we see this? Uh, please, um, everybody support the documentary that they want to do. It's <laughs> probably more important than anything else to get this together, get people to help, and then 
go and ask for the funding to get this information out to as many people as possible. Uh, for every dollar given to develop this documentary by people, it will help at least 20 people. Thank you, Dr. And Ted. And we just want to remind you, we have the link at the bottom of your page there at Kickstarter. Um, you can also visit the Unslet Project website if you want to make a donation. Um, all of the people who are speaking here will be featured in our film. Um, I want to uh, go back to Natalie for a second. She works with uh, sex workers, and she brought up obstacles that they face in particular. Um, do you want to speak to how we might work against that, Natalie? Okay. Gang, i got to go because I'm hanging a show, and they're waiting for me to decide. Uh, on female sexuality behind the Iron Curtain, and I'm doing a wonderful show, so I'm going to go and deal with that. <laughs> okay, well, thank you, Dr. Ted. All right, bye-bye. Oh, yeah, we're getting to the end of the hour. Well, I just hope that uh, Natalie will be able to answer. Are you there? No, nope. Natalie, you're on mute. Well, maybe um, Carol or Amy would be able to speak to that as well. What obstacles we're facing in this? No, Amy had to I leave. Silence is, is one of the biggest obstacles. I really want to challenge everyone who cares about these issues, um, who has um, junior high and high school and college age kids in their family to talk openly about these issues and listen to what they say if they know about these kinds of, of happenings, what they have to say about them. Really make them something that you can discuss in, in mixed company. That's what this is going to take. Make it okay to talk about this and make it okay that we all say that it's not okay to continue. Mm -hmm. Agreed. Uh, we have a question from Dexter Richards who says, do any of you agree that sex ed teaching about relationship issues would help lower slut shaming? Um, I don't know if any of you can speak to that. Sex ed teaching about relationship issues. Or Dr. Queen, if, you, if our whole lives, the program that you recommended, um, addresses relationship issues, do you know? I think it does, and, and, and I do think that this is part of what, you know, sexuality is, is the body, the body's feelings, the, the feelings that a body has alone or with another person, and how you configure your relationship, whether it's touched by sexual stereotypes, which clearly is a problem with slut shaming, whether or not, and, and, and sexual harassment and, and uh, and date rape and sexual violence, too, also, also. And whether or not somebody is able to, um, to get what they want and, and express what they want to express in relationships without falling back on power over issues and, and inability to communicate intimacy, I think those things really are part of the, the mix. Um, and, and just in general, remembering that we need to learn to respect each other, all of us, it's, it's a fundamental lack of respect to do this to somebody. It's a fundamental lack of respect to, to send your girlfriend's naked picture around to your friends, even if you really love her. So if there's a lot going on here. Yeah, and I think, um, I think that kind of leads us into our last uh, question here. What, what do we predict for the future? How do we see this playing out? as we move forward, as all of us continue doing what we're doing, everyone who's interested continues working toward this on an individual level, what, um, what do we see happening and how long is it going to take for this um, cultural norm to develop and change? Well, I look back to, the, to the, the days of my youth which were influenced by a kind of sexual revolution discourse, right, where there was this notion that if you were sexually adventurous, um, that it was okay, sort of, <laughs> and, and love the one you're with was a song that we sang. And, and I think these days there's a notion that if you're a slut, you're not being intimate. You know, you're not, you're not doing something that's worthy of respect. You're not, you're not being that person that, that Ted was talking about. I really, I really hoped I would meet some people like that. And, I don't see any reason why we can't try to turn the arc of this problem toward a question of sexual activity with somebody else is a great thing and it should be honored, not it's something that you guys get over on each other and you're ashamed of later. That, I think, is really an important uh, direction to try to move because making it more 
problematic to have sex doesn't cure this problem. I think probably some people think that that is what should be happening, but that won't cure this problem because it again delegitimizes sexual play and sexual curiosity and sexual adventure. So even when even in the best case scenario when people are all doing this because they want to and they're enjoying themselves, if it's devalued and thought of poorly, that leaves the participants, especially the girls, open to slut shaming. Well, thank you, Carol. And um, that brings us to the end of our hour. Um, we've had a great conversation here. I think I want to thank Ava and um, Creative Sexuality Education for hosting and helping us organize this event. And I want to thank all of our panelists, Leora Tannenbaum, Dr. Amy Marsh, Natalie Mills, Dr. Carol Queen, and Dr. Ted McElvenna, who have all um, been wonderful here tonight and are going to be featured in our upcoming SLUT, a documentary film. We hope that all of you have had a great time. Thank you for your questions. We hope that you'll support our Kickstarter, which is linked at the bottom of your page um, and which you can find on the Unslut Project website. And spread the word. Uh, we've got less than a week left to meet our goal, and we really are moving in the right direction and hope that you can help us make it. So thank you all so much. Have a good night. Good night. Good night. Thanks, Emily.